Good afternoon, everyone. It is really a huge pleasure to welcome you all to our World Cafe. Let's talk about childhood obesity. We are joining forces, and uh, that's the second year. The first seminar where the first webinar where four projects, four big project consortium, are joining forces together, and it seems quite productive because we have got so many participants to this uh, webinar. And the four projects are STOP, PAIN, Co-Create, and Joint Action Best Remap, all of them dealing with childhood obesity. And we want to address global childhood obesity epidemic really successfully, sustainable, and what is most important with the implementable, efficient outcomes so that we would really change the obesogenic environment and give the children at the planet better future, specifically in Europe. And uh, just very shortly, STOP is the science and technology in childhood obesity. It's, uh, it's building multidisciplinary evidence based in five policy areas and also developing policy tools with so respected partners uh, together with uh, WHO Geneva and OECD. The PIN is the policy evaluation network developing tools to identify, evaluate and benchmark policies in nutrition and physical activity. And CREATE is um, building more on experimental approaches, how policy ch changes can support healthy eating. And specifically, they are engaging youth, young generation, those to whom all those measures are uh, dedicated. And the uh, Best Remap is a project which um, is uh, specific because it's, uh, it's composed uh, by the member states and um, it is uh, not a competing uh, consortium, but it's really the implementing consortium. And we would um, like to start the series of uh, events uh, prepared by those four big consortiums um, in uh, giving uh, you more insights, what we are doing, how we want to achieve our goals. Uh, just to say that two of the projects are from Horizon 2020, one is from the Joint Programming Initiative and one is the Joint Action of the Member States. We have two events in June and two in September and the theme of the first one is improving health and uh, food environments to build a stronger European Union. I would like to go to the housekeeping, um, just a few um, mentions that event will be recorded that you have noticed. Please use the question and answer function to post comments and questions and the recording and slides uh, will be circulated post webinar so you will be able to look at that again. But I really encourage you do and go into the chat and chat and ask because we will be able to respond and also the, uh, the presenters will be able to respond to your questions and comments. Um, I would like you also to meet the chairs, it's not just me. It's also Professor Wolfgang Ahrens. Myself, I'm coming from the National Institute of Public Health in Slovenia, and I'm coordinator of Joint Action Best Remap, and also the coordinator of uh, the Work Package 10 within Stop Dealing with Stakeholders. And Wolfgang, I'm giving you the word just to shortly present yourself. Yes, as uh, you can already see on the slide, I'm director of the Leibniz Institute, deputy director of the Leibniz Institute for Prevention research and epidemiology. My focus is epidemiology of non-communicable diseases and I'm coordinator of the PEN project which builds on our learnings from the previous decades where we have learned that just trying to change behavior is not effective and that we have to address upstream factors. Uh, so PEN, the Policy Evaluation Network, uh, aims to evaluate policy measures to promote a healthy diet and physical activity of the populations in terms of content. So what is the content of such interventions, the implementation and the effectiveness of such policy interventions. And you will hear more of it in the presentations. Thank you, Wolfgang. I will say just uh, very shortly a few words about joint action best remap. As I said, uh, this is a joint action, not a competing consortium, but the member states themselves have, have decided the priority areas of joint work and within the council conclusions, they, they have defined what they want to do together and the competent authorities were nominated uh, by the member states. That's so important to understand because here the implementation power at the national and EU levels uh, lays 
and uh, we are dealing with three big areas that is reformulation restricting food marketing to children and uh, improving public procurement of food in public settings where, ch where children gather so we hope that we will be able uh, by by engaging so many member states we have 22 from eu and two assessing uh, member states that we will be really able to substantially influence um, the environment the improvement in the environment but shortly let's go to the agenda of today in the first part you will hear something more about the work package six in joint action battery map on reducing marketing of unhealthy foods to children and uh, then we will have the part where the colleagues from pain project is go they are going to speak about the their topics in nutrition and physical activity and afterwards we will have the panel uh, discussion with some closing remarks at the end and what we want to show by that is if we join forces we can understand better what's going on we can really align our activities we do not overlap but we add we, we will try to find synergies, we will try to really get better and upgrade it and add its values in what we are doing. So I would just like to introduce you also the speakers. Um, we have with us Margarita Pizza, she's uh, from uh, Portugal, I, I have to say, but only now I have noticed she's Portugal, but also the partners, the co-leading partners in this work package are from Ireland. Then Joanna Toposka from Poland, uh, Lion Kelly from Ireland and uh, also Kevin Wolf, uh, his co-worker and Kate Aldrich uh, Turner from UK, she will be speaking about database at the end. But now uh, we can start with the first presenter and I'm happy to spare some time for the discussions afterwards. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to announce Margarita Bitsa. She, she will be talking about best practices in reducing marketing of unhealthy food products children. Uh, Margarida is uh, part of the team leading this work in battery map and uh, I have to say that it's really nice to observe how systematically they are approaching um, this uh, really quite demanding action. Margarida, the work is yours. Thank you so much Monica for, for presenting me and for your kind words and thank you very much. It's with great honor that I'm here today uh, doing this presentation. Uh, I'm Margarida Vica, I'm a public health nutritionist and I work in the Portuguese Directorate General of Health. I work together with Maria João Gregorio um, and Maria João and Ursula, as uh, mentioned by Mochka, are leading this work package on best practice to reduce marketing of unhealthy food um, to children and adolescents. The next slide, please. So, um, Food marketing to children is still a global and is a global phenomenon, and we know that uh, marketing uh, influences children's food preferences and also consumption patterns. And in this regard, several um, international institutions, as the World Health Organization, have issued recommendations to uh, member states to act on this um, on this topic. And so, I will briefly um, present some of these key recommendations. Um, so at first, to define um, a measure, uh, it's recommended that this measure is uh, government-led and so a mandatory legislation, for example, that has been proved to be more effective than other types of approaches as self-regulations. Um, within the planning, implementation and also evaluation of this measure, uh, it's also recommended to have intersector working groups. Um, that gather not only the health sector, but other sectors as consumer and child protection, um, culture, education sectors, and also very importantly, uh, audiovisual and advertising authorities. Within the measure, um, this measure should protect children up to 18 years of age, as it's also uh, established in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the measure should include all forms of marketing, different channels, settings, and techniques. This because the measure should aim to uh, reduce the exposure of children to, but also the power of marketing uh, of unhealthy products as products high in sugar, salt, uh, and fat. The measure should also include and envision a strong nutrient profile model to identify products within the restrictions. After the implementation of this measure, um, 
we should have a robust monitoring and enforcement um, system uh, that evaluates also all the channels, settings and techniques. And by channels, I'm mentioning, for example, broadcasts, um, but also digital marketing and cinema settings as schools, um, health centers and also sports and cultural activities and techniques. Um, the most uh, marketing has been developing a lot um, in terms of um, more integrating and more um, proactive um, techniques as sponsorship, but also social media, influencers, viral marketing and advert gaming. And I started with these recommendations. Um, next slide, please. Um, because within Best Free Map and especially on Work Package 6, we are trying to uh, develop uh, uh, tools and, and other activities that are in line with these key recommendations uh, and that aim to support member states um, in, in, then, in thereafter implement and act actively on, on this field and to reduce and protect children. Um, the main deliverable and final deliverable of this joint action is going to be the EU harmonized framework for action on reducing unhealthy food marketing to children. And this framework gathers um, the work developed during um, the course of the joint action in this work package uh, by, by the team and also uh, with the extraordinary contributions of the participating partners and collaborating partners of our work package six. Um, this framework, um, so the first milestone is already established and uh, we um, established a EU expert group, but also intersector working groups in all the participating member states. Uh, we are now in the process of defining an, a, a proposal for a EU harmonized and non-term profile model, developing guidance for voluntary and regulatory codes of practice, and also we will develop an EU harmonized and comprehensive monitoring uh, protocol. Just next slide, please. Uh, just to go a bit more um, in depth to this to these uh, tasks. Uh, the first, the harmonized nutrient profile model. We have as the basis of this proposal the WHO Regional Office for Europe nutrient profile model. But we also looked at the Slovenian and the Portuguese nutrient profile models. Um, once these countries have already adapted this uh, nutrient profile model from WHO and implemented. So all the challenges um, brought by these countries and also for all of the other participating countries are taking are being taken into account in the development of this uh, harmonized proposal. For the guidance for regulatory and voluntary codes of practice, um, the team is going to have the European Commission Joint Research Central Toolkit as a basis, and also uh, the Irish Voluntary Codes of Practice. At last, for the EU harmonized and comprehensive monitoring protocols, uh, countries have been asked also um, what protocols have been implemented and used, and in some cases also countries have been piloting some of these frameworks as the WHO Quick Monitoring Framework. Um, and so this, this four um, approaches and, and protocols will also be used to develop this comprehensive and harmonized uh, protocol as the WHO Quick Monitoring Framework has mentioned that will evaluate, that is, is, was developed to monitor digital marketing, also the WHO protocols and templates that evaluate other types of, um, of channels and techniques, um, also the monitoring, uh, Nordic monitoring protocol, and at last the informers approach. This was a very brief um, and um, through, I, I tried to went through the, um, the key recommendation and also try to explain the work that we have been developing in uh, Best Free Map, but as the time is so short, I will end now and hopefully uh, be able to answer all your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Margarita. Okay, okay. So, thank you, Margarita, for this uh, very, really short and concise at the time uh, explanation what Work Package Six is doing, because um, we are really um, quite varied. Variety. We have. We are diverse around Europe. Maybe uh, because I can see really questions linked to your presentations at the moment. But please. Uh, uh, put them in the chat if you have them. If you if you just explain more in addition, uh, how many countries are 
joining this uh, work package, how many countries in Europe, and uh, yeah, that would be my first additional explanation from your side, hopefully. Margarita? Sorry, Magic, I think I stopped listening. Can you please repeat? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Because I was uh, not so listening. Yeah, just, just for the beginning, uh, how many countries, if you can just explain how many countries are in ah, this yes. packet so that we see how, and how many uh, member states we can, we can expect that changes. Yeah, we have 16 countries, uh, participating countries in our uh, work package. Yeah, with, that's plus uh, Ireland and Portugal. Yes, we have here the question in chat. Uh, marketing of products are usually the domain of EU national legislation, etc. How can local communities, health and care organizations do tackle this? Um, this is really a challenge, yeah, because uh, if you if you think about the digital environment, which is really flowing everywhere, how what can what can be done at the local communities, healthcare organizations? Um, so I agree with the, firstly, I agree with the comment that um, it's actually a domain of EU and le national legislations. As mentioned, uh, we, if we don't have a national legislation, it's harder to ensure compliance and to ensure that we really restrict and protect, restrict the marketing and protect children. Uh, but I think that uh, local communities and health and care organizations um, may also help uh, because they have a word and they have a, an option to restrict marketing in their facilities and also to help um, because I think that for sure this is um, a legislation matter, but education and also awareness for this topic is also very important because uh, as we are aware, um, maybe some families and even civil society are not aware of how damaging and how harmful this marketing can be. And so um, all the awareness and uh, education tools that can be used in this regard are very important. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Mochka, if you, yes, thank uh, you. as thank an you expert, so has also <laughs> has something to add to my comment. No, thank you. I think you were quite good because uh, we have to think also about from cross-border marketing and so on. Yeah, that's why we, we really have to, work to, to be active at all of the levels. Um, I'm just uh, trying not to neglect the first question from Astrid because uh, there was a question how genetic uh, inherits obesity is and whether children are more likely to be born with a disease caused by obese parents. That's a question which should be addressed to our sub partners and uh, we will definitely answer to that when the sub is presenting uh, because they are studying, they have a specific work package exactly on that topic and uh, please join us at that occasion. Uh, but the next question is coming from Marlene. Uh, will your nutrition profile model be finalized in time to input uh, into the Commission work on this topic? Because Commission plans to come with an EU model by second, uh, the fourth quarter of 22. And how? That's that's now um, the question. Um, maybe maybe <laughs> this is uh, the the question where uh, we we will we will be studying in joint action best remap the WHO nutrition profile as it is mentioned in AVMSD and uh, we will uh, we will work with it as we did in Slovenia and uh, Portugal and recently just recently if you don't know yet uh, in Austria they succeeded also to implement their nutrition profile based on on the work uh, in WHO. So at the WHO level, there are some adaptations of the uh, WHO nutrition profile model, not the substantial ones, but those which have been through the implementation seen as the necessary and obvious ones. And we are definitely also uh, engaged quite heavily in the discussions about how to and what to do with the EU model, uh, because the ideas how to compose the EU model are different, but at the moment we are working as it was foreseen uh, in the project um, in the project core. But Margarita, um, any additional information? Yeah, just to mention are... that, uh, of course, we are develop developing this uh, proposal based on the WHO, but also uh, gathering uh, feedback from the countries, the participating countries and other experts. And this is a live in document. So our proposal will be adapted during the course of the joint action accordingly to, to further mm -hmm. developments from WHO and also for um, from other plans. And of course, the commission um, as, uh, mm -hmm. is a partner of our joint action. So all the, the efforts are um, hopefully um, we don't um, we want to collaborate all together and, and uh, 
So yeah. yes, of course. I, I may just ask, may, may just add that if you look at the EU beating cancer plan, you can read there where the plan is discussing the prevention and the promotion in the lifestyles. It's approximately page 10 and 11. There is specifically mentioned that the Commission is expecting a lot from Joint Action Best Remet. Um, so we we really are keen to deliver uh, according to these expectations. So um, we are definitely engaging uh, also with the Commission uh, within the Joint Action. We have a specific body, um, which is Policy Decision Making Forum, where we would like to meet with uh, the relevant representatives of uh, different DGs responsible for the uh, for the solutions, legislative solutions and uh, other solutions at the EU level so that we would align whatever outcomes we will produce as the member states at the end uh, to the plans of the overall commission. So I think that's responding to that question. We have another one. How do you, how are you monitoring internet use channels in there? But yeah, that's something what <laughs> <laughs> where your expert is really crazy. Okay. Yeah. No, um, thank you. Um, so the this part of the joint action is still going to start, but we have some countries already piloting, as mentioned, some of the um, some of the frameworks, especially CLIC. Um, the WHO CLIC monitoring framework has several steps and combines different types of approaches to monitor. Uh, digital and healthy food marketing, um, not food actually, and healthy products. Uh, so also tobacco and alcohol are included in this framework. Um, and they have technologies that um, enable us to um, assess uh, children direct, direct from children's phones, um, what they are seeing on social media, especially paid for advertisement, but other also techniques that are being developed to capture on screen. So not only capture the paid for advertisement, but all that it's appearing on the screen. So also product placement and also uh, peer and influencers uh, content generated by, by them, that it's usually not so, so easy to be captured. And uh, this is a very big challenge because uh, this is very targeted and it varies between um, each phone and each uh, tablet and each device. So this is a big challenge, but um, but I think we are moving forward in developing uh, approaches mm -hmm. and softwares for, for this. Also, the, the other protocols from WHO um, are more uh, researcher uh, research um, focused, but they also uh, enable us to um, monitor uh, websites, social media, and also television and other types of um, channels. Um, I may leave here in the chat uh, the link for these protocols and templates if you want to check. Yes, please, Margarita, let's do it. Um, and it's uh, really, we, we are trying to implement uh, this tool in Slovenia too, a lot of ethical concerns, but I think that we, together with WHO, we have solved them mainly, and uh, it's really challenging. Um, why the inclusion of voluntary codes when mandatory measures are best practice? Uh, because we think that's uh, still step-by-step -step approach and um, uh, definitely we are going in the most efficient direct direction, but some of the countries are uh, still willing to employ both or just one of them. So we are trying to um, get as many options which would, which would lead to improvement of the environment. Um, and if I may... And if I may add also, as mentioned in the audiovisual media service director, because they um, encourage countries to develop these codes. And so we want to give countries all mm -hmm. the tools and support that they may need to follow this, uh, this directive. Yes, thank you so much, Margarida. Uh, the commission has also financed two studies on the impact on children of digital marketing, alcohol and of food high in fat, sugar and salt. This may be useful as reference, yes. Um, I have to say that we are building on that what the Commission has previously financed also on UREMA for reformulation so that everything engaged and included. Um, we are trying to build on as many as many useful resources and joining forces wherever, wherever possible and that's why we have this webinar today. Um, can you share the link to these two surveys? Yes, of course, uh, Margarita will do that immediately after this presentation. And I think that we have answered uh, all the questions and we are still one minute before. We have to start with the next uh, 
with the next 10 minutes panel, where we have three different panelists. I'm very happy about that. And Margarita, thanks for your inputs till now. Okay. An, an examination of the public policies that hold promise for increasing population levels of physical activities. First, we have uh, Joanna, please, Joanna, can you have your, uh, your initial input for this presentation? Hello, I have problems. Uh, hi. Hi, hi. I, I think I'm going to speak first, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Yeah, I'm just go on. Um, thank you. And, and thanks for the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Um, so just to, to follow on from Wolfgang's introduction, um, we're going to be presenting some of the work of the PEN, uh, the Policy Evaluation Network. And myself and my colleagues, Joanna and, and Kevin, are primarily involved in Work Package 1 and the physical activity aspect of a work package one, um, which is looking at uh, developing a physical activity environmental uh, policy index. Um, so this is based on the food epi that would have been developed by Informus. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. So here we have um, the prototype of, of the PA epi, and you'll see there's two, two components, um, policy and infrastructure. And within those uh, components, we have various domains. And then this leads to uh, a number of indicators within those domains. So as I said, this is the prototype. Um, the domains that are indicated for policy are based on ISPA's eight best investments that work for physical activity. And the infrastructure support domains are, are based on those developed by Informus for the Food Epi. And we're currently in the process of um, working on developing the, the indicators for each of those domains uh, through uh, a very, uh, through a process of a combination of literature review, both grey literature and published uh, scientific evidence, along with uh, expert opinion. Um, so, yeah, as part of uh, this development of the PAEP and looking at the scientific evidence, we've had to do a number of systematic literature reviews and we're going to present uh, some of the findings for, um, from those reviews. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so here we have just an overview of the school's uh, systematic literature review. Um, in terms of it, the aim of the... It, the review itself was to ascertain the level and type of evidence reported in scientific literature for policies within the school settings um, that contribute directly or indirectly to increasing physical activity. As you can see, there is a number of policy areas um, identified through the systematic literature review. Um, I won't list them all out there. They're, they're noted on the, on the diagram and on the right hand side. And then within those these policy areas, there were a number of policy actions identified as well. Um, due to time constraints, I, I won't get into the methodology of, of the systematic literature review. Um, the paper is published and will be available, it's available online, or I can send a link to anyone that, that wants to look at it in greater detail. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. And here we have just an overview of um, the frequency and strength uh, by policy area. And we can see that sport and extracurricular uh, physical activity was by far the most frequent um, area that was identified in, in the uh, review on schools. Um, to summarize some of the key findings, we found that the evidence supports the effectiveness of physical activity policy actions within the school setting but uh, cautions against the one size fits all approach um, and that there was a real need for greater clarity between the terminology, measurement and methods for evaluation of policy interventions. Uh, we found that uh, especially uh, clarity be between definitions, uh, interventions and, and policy seem to be used interchangeably throughout a number of studies and within multi-component and multi-level approaches um, Although recommended, it was very hard to extract uh, the policy and within those and whether policy was actually evaluated. It's of, often referred to, but when you look at the, the results and go into greater detail, it's hard to, to isolate policy from that. Um, 
and there is a greater need to emphasize and exam policy implementation to maximize translation in, into practice. Um, so that's just a very quick overview of the schools uh, systematic literature review. Uh, Kevin now, I think, is going to speak to you in terms of the sport, and, and Joanna is going to speak um, to you after Kevin uh, in relation to transport. Thank you. Hello, all. I hope I'm not missing the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, so I have I have four key messages with regards to promoting physical activity via sport, uh, summarizing the findings of the sport review. So those are build it and they will come, financial instruments of complex effects, organizing sport may not hold the keys to the kingdom and the least are active are hard to reach with sport. So let's start with the former. So evidence from seven studies included in our investigations indicated that providing spaces and facilities for sport leads to increased participation and hence increased physical activity. So this might seem intuitive enough, but there is a fear that in theory, if you have enough sport facilities in an area, it might be a waste of time and resources to build more. However, in the studies which we uh, found, it was the case that more sports spaces was consistently related to greater participation. Uh, perhaps if you are building some very exclusive high performance facilities, a velodrome, for example, or it might not be a very good type of promotion investment, but a multi-purpose space, perhaps with hoops and uh, hoops for basketball and nets for other sports uh, seems to be. So next, with regard to financial instruments um, having complex effects. So the 11 studies in this category looked at a variety of measures, including tax incentives, voucher programs, and subsidized entry to facilities owned by local authorities. Uh, voucher programs showed some effectiveness, but the effects of the other measures were equivocal. Uh, subsidized entry may incentivize some people while displacing regular users. And the main effect of tax incentives for, for sport participation seems to be to distribute money in a maladaptive way. In short, there were under unintended consequences and second order effects to this for uh, to this category to the to uh, actions in this category. So the third action is organised sports may not hold the key to the kingdom. Um, so sports uh, clubs are often staffed by volunteers who are, whose ability or willingness to take on further recruiting spot responsibilities or collaborate with other persons may be limited. Um, Further sports organizations cater to their existing membership or people who may be quite active already. Therefore, the capacity of sports organizations to promote physical, physical activity might be quite limited. And then that leads to the final point was that these interventions generally appear to more to be more successful in semi-sporty people. Um, or I have discussed a few actions that have been taken to promote sport participation and hence physical activity. But a common refrain in many of the stories uh, was that this intervention was effective in people who were somewhat motivated to participate in sport anyway, or in essence semi-sporty or contemplative or curious. Uh, this indicates that the proportion of people who are interested in participation in sport is, is substantially due to factors outside of the traditionally conceived domain of sports policy. So thank you for your attention. I'll hand you over to Joanna. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I'm trying to start my video. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, and uh, my research group was responsible for um, systematic li literature review uh, within the transport domain. So we were looking which transport policies positively influence physical activity of the whole society. And uh, you can see here, this is our uh, literature inclusion flow chart uh, on the left side of the le left bottom side of the of the slide we search um, almost 4000 records and ended with uh, 17 research papers and within the 17 we research papers um, we identified uh, we identified 51 policy actions which had a and add evidence uh, influencing positively influencing physical activity and um, to be able to synthesize uh, our data uh, we have broken out uh, we have broken up uh, the, those policies into three groups and the first group was convenient transport infrastructure and within the within this group we identified identified uh, 33 uh, policy actions 
Second one was active travel programming and promotion, it was nine, and shift of transport mode, uh, again, nine. Um, what, what is, uh, what is uh, very important is that we have, uh, we have uh, conducted our, um, this analysis uh, at the three policy levels. We have identified uh, the policies at the three policy level individual, organizational, and uh, community level. And um, in the convenient transport infrastructure, uh, this, is, uh, this, is this, this is this one. Uh, uh, we have found that uh, all, the, all, the, uh, all the interventions were, interventions were reported on the uh, on the community level, which is obvious because everyone invests in infrastructure at the community level. Uh, in the active travel uh, promoting and programming, it was different. It was a little bit at the community, mostly on the organizational level and some of individual. And uh, in the shift of transport mode, uh, it was uh, organizational and community uh, mainly. Uh, what is uh, what is very important is that the most of the of the actions policy uh, actions were identified within this uh, convenient transport infrastructure uh, group, and uh, this is the, the most promising uh, part of influencing uh, people just by providing them uh, transport infrastructure. Um, uh, what 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 should I also mention is that um, uh, is that uh, within this group also the most uh, uh, the post the most positive the, the, the highest number of positive uh, uh, significant positive uh, policy actions influencing uh, uh, physical activity were, were identified. Uh, also in active travel uh, programming. And uh, uh, you can see this pink part in the uh, shift of transport mode. So uh, yeah, so these were, uh, so these were our, uh, our findings. And uh, uh, yeah, so we have found that the highest number of, of interventions uh, came from, from the area of convenient transport infrastructure. Uh, and over 50% of uh, these policy actions were, were, were coded as a significant uh, positive, which is, uh, very, which is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much to Jana and to all three of you. It is really, it is really interesting and a lot, a lot of different uh, information. So the time is really short for such a rich, rich presentation, but I'm sure that uh, all the participants can go and look into the policy evaluation network uh, uh, web page and definitely we hope we will have some minutes uh, at the end for questions. Um, now we are going to the last presentation of today which is the moving database and I'm kindly invite, inviting uh, Kate Aldrich Turner. She's uh, head of policy and public affairs at World Cancer Research International. So it's not pain, it's not best remap, it's, uh, it's the World Cancer Research Fund. Please uh, Kate. The word is yours, your few minutes, and please stick with the time. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to just introduce you to the Moving Database, which has been developed as part of the Co-Create project. Um, Co-Create is the shorthand name for Confronting Obesity, Co-Creating Policy with Youth, which is a five-year Horizon 2020 project. Um, and we are one of um, a consumer of 14 and our responsibilities in what package two relate to looking at what available policies there are um, and so I will just speak to that very briefly. Next slide. So um, as part of the co-create project we um, firstly developed a uh, policy framework which is called the moving policy framework and that was developed back in 2018 and we developed the framework um, based on an analysis of global physical activity policy literature, including the WHO's Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. Um, we looked at the results, uh, we refined them, um, analyzed them, and then following several rounds of consultation with physical activity policy experts, we um, 
developed the framework, which is the image you see on the right. Um, it doesn't normally have red boxes around there. Um, I've just added them to kind of highlight the different elements. So the moving framework is uh, structured around four policy domains, which are at the top. So active society, active environment, active people. And then there's another cross-cutting um, domain called active systems, which looks at issues such as uh, governance systems, leadership, surveillance, um, interdisciplinary research, monitoring and evaluation and such like. And then we have six policy areas. So each letter of the moving framework, M-O-V-I-N-G, stands for a different policy area. And each of these policy areas are aligned with the uh, four policy domains in the WHO Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. Um, and uh, the framework basically creates the scope for the moving database and it's the organizing structure for the database. Next slide, please. So back um, actually uh, this time last year, we launched the moving database, um, which has now, uh, which was put alongside our existing um, database of, of nutrition policy actions called Nourishing. So now we have a, a platform where you can search both, but moving is new. Um, and it uh, has physical activity policy actions across the, the six different policy areas. So we have um, policy areas in education, workplace, transport, um, in the community, health professionals um, and such like. So it was launched last year and to date it has 279 policy actions from 14 European countries. Um, and we also are adding policy evaluations as well. Um, we have started with a European scope in line with the Co-Create project, and I'll explain um, in a moment how we, we add the policies. So some new things that we've put on the database, um, for those who may be familiar with Nourishing, um, we've enhanced them as well. So you can share all the results on social media. We've also made all the um, data entries downloadable in a CSV file. We've created a glossary of definitions and tips on how to search the database. And the big difference is this um, database is continuously updated. So as soon as we have uh, policy actions that are eligible in terms of scope, and then they have to be national and in effect, then we will update them. So we have a uh, video on our uh, website, which explains all about the databases and how to search them. Um, so I really strongly advise um, you to have a look at that. Next slide. And I'll just show you what we found so far. So a, a great variety, um, 74 community and sport recreation policies. So the highest number in that uh, policy area, but lots in the school environment, the built environment, uh, transport as well, physical activity guidelines um, and communication campaigns. So we have policies in all six policy areas um, and you're able to look up um, certain countries and in certain policy areas as well. So it's great functionality to do that. Next slide, please. So how do we add the policies? So firstly, we're doing a, an in-depth European scan. So that's a systematic search at, for national level policies. And we're doing that across 27 European countries. And that's in line with the scope of the Co-Create project um, to kind of really look at what's out there. To be eligible for the database, the policy has to be um, supported by the government. It has to be currently in effect and it has to relate to um, one of the policy areas of the moving framework and the nourishing framework for that database. Um, they specifically have to have a focus on reducing obesity and or um, phys uh, promoting physical activity and for nourishing, it's also diet related NCDs by promoting um, healthy diets. And for quality assurance, we ensure that every policy that's on our database is verified and checked by an in-country expert. So typically um, a government official in the relevant ministry. As well as the in-depth European search, we um, conduct ongoing surveillance worldwide to see what's going on um, around the world. And we'll add um, those policies on an ongoing basis. Right now, we've taken more of a, a focus on the European side, but that's changing and we're adding global policies as well. So we should have a really, um, really full and rich database. Um, and just to really reiterate, it's continuously updated um, and please uh, go have a look. And we will be doing some social media um, 
at the end of the month to kind of celebrate the first birthday of the moving database. So we'd be delighted for your support. And I will leave it there. And I will add a link to the database in the chat now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, really nice presentation. And it's good to see that the nourishing database is uh, getting a counterpart in, uh, in uh, physical activity. So I see that uh, you have been sharing links uh, in, uh, thanks Liam to share the link in the chat to the paper you mentioned and also to Kate for sharing the link. And I see that uh, Joanna has shared uh, the examples of the uh, of the um, case studies uh, in pain. But um, do you have any other um, questions for the team pain and for co-create for Kate? Otherwise, we are reaching, namely the oh, I'm so sorry, checking um, the chat. We are reaching the timing when I can forward the word to Wolfgang. And if any question is coming in the chat, uh, Wolfgang and the panelists could answer to that question afterwards. Um, so there is a question in the chat, have you in consideration the psychological support uh, of children? But I think that that would be a question for co-create or it's also for us. Wolfgang, I would just give you the word. The time is yours, last 15 minutes. I tried to start my video. Now I'm allowed to do it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mocha, for uh, chairing the session. And uh, thanks, you presenters, for uh, keeping the time and giving us uh, this uh, very quick overview. I'm actually, I'm just wondering whether we should uh, allow a brief answer to the last question uh, that, that uh, was put in the chat <clears throat> regarding the uh, psychological support for children because uh, and then there's another question uh, learnings how to develop the behavior change skills in the normalized policy action maybe you can give a brief answer before we uh, enter into the panel discussion you're muted Sorry, right. uh, I'm not sure I could give you the the specifics on the top of my head I can go away in the few minutes um, perhaps during your session to pull out examples, but we certainly um, look at um, in school and outside school interventions. And then uh, we also, um, within the scope, we look at giving physical activity training, assessment and counselling in healthcare settings. Um, and I'm sure that that would be included for, for children as well. Um, but what I can do is perhaps in the next session, um, just try and pull some things up and share it um, with the, the questioner and give a more concrete example. But the, the main message is that we would include that in the scope of the database. So we would be searching and collecting examples of those policies um, in the countries that we're looking at. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, may I ask a, a special question, specific question to Margarita uh, regarding the, the monitoring of um, um, in, in your project. Um, and there was already mentioning of the youth channels and I, I was also wondering uh, what, what this means and how this can be done, especially the, um, the field of social media and influencers acting on the social media. Um, if, if there comes a legislation, um, how can you handle this? How could you, do you have ideas how violations of the marketing restrictions would be penalized? I mean, would they receive a fine when they uh, uh, don't uh, adhere to the, to the restrictions or what, what, is, uh, what will be done in order to enforce uh, the restrictions? Uh, thank you. Um, this is actually a very big challenge um, since it also includes a lot of um, ethical issues and uh, individual and personal um, issues um, regarding the the influencers um, they have some codes of practice that they have to um, tell if they are being if this is a advertisement or if this is paid or not but uh, they still have a lot of freedom of course to produce their own and generate content um, 
And so this is a big challenge because if we enter there, then we are entering in individuality of and freedom of each um, person and individual. Uh, so this is a big challenge. And that's why also in here, in my opinion, um, it also has a lot of influence, the education and how we approach this issue uh, from an early age to schools and parents and to and to these influencers trying to understand that they have a very big influence in children and adolescents. And if they, even if they have the freedom to post and print and generate content um, in their own uh, freedom, they have to also be aware that they are influencing children um, and, and adolescents. So um, if the, the advertisement is, uh, if the, if the content is is an advertisement and it was specially targeting, for example, in a, if the law says that it's, uh, the, the the restrictions are to cover children up to 16 years age, of age and this specific advertisement or like this specific post was towards was directed to children under 16 of age then yes they are um they are going against the law and in that in those cases they they can have fines and then it depends on also how the law is um developed but they can have of course um fines on because they were um, not complying with the law. I don't know if I replied exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we got an impression how complex uh, the situation mm -hmm. is. And I asked the question because I have the feeling that sometimes the internet behaves like the Wild West and we have no, no, no handle of it uh, yet. Uh, no, and also... Um, and also the, the, the techniques and approaches that are being developed are still... Um, have still to be improved in order to be really um, a monitoring, like um, uh, to be really an enforcement of the law because we can now yeah. monitor, but to have a continuous monitoring is very challenging. That's true. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I have another question that is uh, addressing uh, Kate and uh, the other three from uh, the PEN project, um, because I, I assume that in the audience, uh, the same question popped up in, in, in a few heads. Um, I mean, the uh, Physical Activity um, Environment Policy Index and the moving concept, they, have, uh, they do have some overlap, right? And uh, at the same time, they may have be uh, distinguishable and uh, they may also be complementary. Uh, so I would like to ask you panelists to maybe explain to the audience where you see an overlap and where you see complementarity uh, of these um, uh, these two approaches. Also, maybe with regards to the target groups. I, I would say that I, for example, found the moving database very useful uh, when for, for in the development of the PAFB. Um, for certain, because when certain um, policy actions are prescribed in the PAFB, there are examples uh, within the uh, in the moving database of similar uh, policies that have been implemented elsewhere. So I think it's certainly the moving is very is very useful in order to point to and say like this has been like I, like this has been this particular action, whether it's, you know, like can be done, it has been done in Portugal, for example. I, I certainly found the, the moving database useful for my own work in that way. So that's one example, sorry. Yeah, just um, the, the moving database has been excellent resource in terms of looking at, at policies. One of the things we found was we, when we were looking at kind of um, evidence of implementation of policy, that's where the PAP would slightly, slightly different, differ. Um, the moving, as I said, it, it's a great resource for examples of policies, but to see if there's any evidence of those policies being implemented. I, I think up to recently, we only came across two that actually showed any level of implementation. So that's where the PAP would, would hopefully build on, on and work in tandem with, with the moving database. 
<laughs> I'm not sure I've got much more to add. But you've highlighted the distinction. <clears throat> we are a repository of information about what is out there. We are trying to create a knowledge bank, um, a resource um, that hopefully um, <clears throat> can be used to track what's out there. But I think that it hopefully creates a foundation for tools such as uh, the ones you're developing to take that next level of analysis. Um, and I, I, I think there's a really good, strong partnership there. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to hear it's being used and that, um, that the hard work we put in is, is, is being utilized. So that's really encouraging to hear. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as Kevin said, like we're we're trying to develop uh, best international practices and um, development of good practice indicators, and that's like it is a good resource to to be able to to go to to try to find those those examples. Okay, um, so thank you for carving this out. I think it's important to to make this distinction clear. Um, there is a a question from the audience. Uh, asking whether uh, you did find good allies in the policy policymakers, politicians. Um, this could be strategic. Uh, Moncha, you are st starting to answer. That's what I see. I don't know whether you want. You have a spontaneous response uh, from the panel. <laughs> yes. Uh... Of course, I, I, I just wanted to answer, not intervene, but of course, uh, it's our experience in Slovenia and also experience now in Best Remap that we have to be in close contact with those who are sitting at different sectors or different DGs. Um, when we are speaking about the policy decision makers, we have at least two levels. One are those really politicians in parties and then they are voted and they are in the parliament and through them, uh, then the final decision, decisions are decided. But uh, if you want to work um, closely to those who are supporting those decisions, you have to work with DGs and with the, the, the sectors. There. With both two levels, you have to be aware what they know about your topic and how do they perceive it. And um, uh, at the end, what will be their decision and what will be their policy solutions uh, they will go for. And um, definitely, if we want to uh, our products, our deliverables, our recommendations, our tools would be once implemented, we have to be in a very good contact here. So I agree with Roberto that that, that is strategic, um, and uh, uh, we have proven that that's, uh, even if it's far more uh, demanding, and uh, you have to um, discuss it and to. Um, to somehow explain what you are doing and to adapt uh, um, into the policy reality, what is possible, what is not possible. At the end, uh, that is the, the, the way which allows for the, the, the highest really, um, or the best outputs, I would say. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, the when you work in health in all policies, this is really something to be patient with. So yeah. step by step. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have another question uh, to the panel, but we have uh, we are out of time now. Uh, so I will try to give the answer myself and you may nod your heads or you may shake your heads. Um, and the question was, um, what these activities, these upstream, these activities that are targeting upstream causes of causes, what they mean with regard to uh, the social divide in terms of health behaviors and health outcomes. And uh, if I were you, I would answer to that question, well, it's exactly the, um, the strength of these upstream approaches that by changing regulatory and environmental factors, we indeed will reach or have better chances to reach those who are most affected and who are most hard to reach, the vulnerable groups in the population. I, I, I hope you can agree with this. Um, and, and this would be my uh, my conclusion for today. But before we close, I would actually uh, like to highlight um, uh, the next meeting. We have uh, the next briefing, which will take pl on the place on the 29th of June, so at the end of this month, in two weeks' time. But then it will uh, take place at 1 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Um, and the title is Childhood Obesity, What are the Root Causes of the Growing Pandemic? So this one will be full of presentations from the STOP project. Uh, very interesting because uh, these are first and fresh results from the STOP project. Um, 
we see the live illustrations from Sally. I assume that this illustration uh, will be shared together with the slides and the, and the recording, right? So no response, but I assume that this will be the case. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Wild well, west of the internet, I see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, if I may say, I went through the participants list and I'm really excited. It's so nice that so many people joined. Also those um, who will be then uh, the most important ones with whom we want to work hand in hand so that we, uh, what we are producing is implemented for good of our children. So from my side, I would also like to thank those who joined uh, us today. Yeah. So then let me say thank you, you presenters and discussants and also the audience for participating actively and hope to see you again uh, or listen to your, your questions again uh, in two weeks time. Thank so you. goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.